Welcome to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we're working on this 2013 Ford Fiesta and the customer complaint is the AC is not working. So let's diagnose this together. Now let's start out by confirming the customer complaint. The car is running right now and the AC is on. So let's get a temperature reading. Now, that was 24, 25 degrees with the uh, AC setting on max. So that's not cold enough. So customer complaint confirmed. Now there's really lots of ways to diagnose an AC problem. We could connect our gauges and look at the pressures and we could go for scan data, scan tool. We could do a visual inspection. Um, lots of ways to approach this problem. Um, I won't be able to go through them all in this video. So as you keep watching my channel, if we get another AC problem, I might do another approach so you guys get to see all the aspects of diagnosing an AC system. Now there's a couple of things I noticed about this particular AC system. When I turn it on, I hear the compressor clutch engaging and the cooling fan kicks in. And that's actually very valuable information. Now just by hearing the compressor clutch engaging and the cooling fan kicking in, we can draw some conclusions and we can rule some things out of being our problem. I've taken the belt cover off and there isn't really a good technical reason for me to do that is just to show you guys that clutch is engaging so I'm going all the way for you guys so you better like this video <laughs> I'm fine I'm fine I'm perfectly fine thank you I've got to explain. It's on a Saturday. I'm in the shop. I'm all alone. I'm shooting this video and I really have got no one to talk to except for you guys. But you guys don't talk back until in a couple of weeks in the comment section of this video. And that's a bad base for a good conversation right now. So sometimes I forget you guys are watching and I think I'm alone. And I get carried away a little bit. But I'm not losing my mind. I'm perfectly, well, perfectly, I'm fine. So let's continue with our AC problem. Now let's hook up a scan tool and see if there are any codes stored that could give us some more direction.
Now let's select Ford 2013 Fiesta and on this particular model the AC is controlled by the PCM so let's go to engine and let's see if there are any codes stored that could give us a better direction. And there is a code stored for the AC. Variable AC compressor control circuit fault. Now so far we have learned that our compressor clutch engages and our cooling fan turns on. We also know we've got this variable AC circuit control fault, but what is a variable AC and how is it controlled? I know that most of my viewers have got a pretty good basic understanding of an AC system. If you don't, or if you want to be refreshed, I might do a separate video on the basic operations of an AC system. For this video, let's concentrate on what we need to know to diagnose this car. Now these are the main components of a variable AC compressor. I took a compressor apart for you guys to see what's inside. Now from brand to brand, the design might vary, but the basic operation stays the same. Let's start off with the front part of our compressor. This is where normally our pulley or clutch would sit. Now you can find these compressors with or without a clutch. That's because these types of compressors don't really need a clutch for their basic operation. Now let's take a closer look to what's inside. These are our pistons. This specific compressor has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pistons, but that number may vary. Now to get a better understanding of this compressor, we'll focus on just one piston. I get the other six pistons out of the way to simplify things. Now when the compressor is assembled, it looks like this. But when we get it apart, we can see our piston goes into a cylinder. In order for the AC system to work, the refrigerant has got to be pumped through the system. Now in order to pump, the piston has got to move up and down in the cylinder. Now very similar to a combustion engine, a compressor needs valves to let gas into and out of the cylinder. Now each of the seven cylinders has got an inlet and an exhaust port. The cylinders have got inlet valves and exhaust valves. These are the exhaust valves. 
they cover the exhaust ports. Now as the piston moves up in the cylinder, the exhaust valves do allow gas or refrigerant to come out of the cylinder, but when the piston goes back down, it doesn't allow the refrigerant to go back. Now the inlet valves do the same thing on the other side. Now in order to get some pumping action, the pistons need to move up and down in the cylinders. Now as the belt drives our drive shaft of our compressor, the drive shaft turns the swash plate. And as you can see, the pistons can move freely as the swash plate turns. Now as this compressor is turning, you can see there's no pumping action of our pistons. And that's why basically these type of compressors have no need for a clutch. Now in order to get a back and forward motion of our pistons, we can set the swash plate at an angle. Now as we turn the swash plate at an angle, we can see we get this asymmetric motion. The motion of the swash plate results in the back and forward motion of our pistons. We've learned we can adjust the stroke of the pistons by adjusting the angle of the swash plate. But how does the PCM adjust the angle of the swash plate? That answer lies in the back of our compressor. In the back of our compressor there is a solenoid. By controlling this solenoid the PCM can open and close passages within our AC compressor. These passages lead to the high and the low side of our AC system. By switching between the high and low side, the compressor can use the pressure of our refrigerant to adjust the angle of the swash plate. Now remember the fault code we had, it said variable AC compressor control circuit fault. Now the only thing controlling our variable compressor is this solenoid. So basically the PCM is telling us there is a problem in the circuit of this solenoid. So let's look at the wiring diagram and do some measurements. Now let's take a quick look at a wiring diagram. And this over here is our AC compressor control valve and we can see there are two wires one brown and white wire coming from a seven and a half amp fuse so that is our feed wire and the other wire must be the control side it's a white and brown wire coming from the PCM on the back of our AC compressor is our control solenoid and indeed there are two wires one brown and white and one white and brown being the power feed coming from a seven and a half amp fuse and a control side coming from the PCM. Now let's start out by back probing that feed wire and see if there's voltage coming from that seven and a half amp fuse and my test light lights up so that's okay. Now while we're in here Let's back probe the other wire and see what we've got on that wire. And on that side, we've got power as well.
We just did this test with key on and engine and AC off. This way we are sure the solenoid is not controlled by the PCM yet. This simple 5 minute test has just provided us with some fantastic information. Let's draw some conclusions. Now the power was coming from a fuse on this side and the control side comes from the PCM on this side. Now the PCM flagged the code for a fault in this circuit somewhere along the way. Now with the test we just did, we confirmed there's a voltage on this side of the connector able to light up a test light. So we've confirmed our fuse and our wiring up to the solenoid is just fine. Now we also measured a voltage on the other side of our solenoid that had enough current flow to light up my test light, confirming the wire integrity within the solenoid. To check the rest of the wiring or circuit because we had a circuit fault is actually very simple. As long as the solenoid is not controlled or switched to ground by the PCM, that voltage coming from the fuse should travel from the fuse through the wire through that solenoid up to that control pin of the PCM. Now if this circuit is okay, the power should run from this fuse down to the solenoid, through the solenoid, up this wire, through this connector, up to connector A, pin 41 of our PCM. The PCM lives next to the battery on this model and I was able to trace down pin 41 and the wiring collar matches the one of our wiring diagram. I had to use a piercing tool and if the circuit up until this point is okay, my test light should light up and it doesn't. So let's check the test light and the test light works. Let's check again. Nothing. We just connected our test light to connector A, pin 41 of our PCM. My test light did not light up. So there's either no voltage over here or at least not enough current flow to light up my test light. My test light did light up at the connector of our solenoid. So somehow there's no path from the connector to pin 41. This can indicate only one thing. There's a break or a very high resistance somewhere along that path. We just tested pin 41 of our PCM. Our test light did not light up. Now, as far as the diagnosis is concerned, this is a valid test. We know there should be enough voltage and current flow at that pin to light up our test light. But does that mean there's really nothing there? There are certain things our test light cannot tell us. So let's do the same test using a power probe. So our power probe just learned us there's three and a half volts on that pin. Something our test light could not tell us. Now that three and a half volts we saw 
is called a bias voltage. And a bias voltage is a voltage the PCM uses to diagnose a circuit. The PCM is expecting that 12 volts going through the circuit and coming back in that pin 41 of the PCM. As we have seen, the 12 volts is not there. This still could mean there is an open or a short to ground. And that's where the bias voltage comes in. As long as the bias voltage doesn't get pulled to ground, the PCM knows there's no short to ground. So there must be an open, or how Fortz calls it, a circuit fault. Remember, a blown fuse is also an open in the circuit. As we take a look at the wiring diagram, we can see our wires of our control solenoid don't go directly to the PCM and to the fuse, but they run through a connector. This is a five wire connector and the other three wires are of the O2 sensor. Now what I want to do is find this connector and see if our problem lies in front of that connector or behind that connector to give us some direction. This connector is located in the left side of our engine bay. Now it turns out to be this connector has a lot more wires than the five I thought there would be. That's because this diagram is only showing us the relevant wires for this circuit. I could have known there were more than five wires looking at the pin numbers. Since we are looking for pin 3 and 28. Now let's see, this is pin 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28. I back probed both sides of pin 28 on the connector. If there's 12 volts coming into the connector, everything in front of our connector is just fine. If there's 12 volts coming out of the connector, a problem lies somewhere between our connector and our PCM. If there's 12 volts coming into the connector, but a bias voltage on the other side, a problem lies in the connector itself.
Well, diagnosed Dan fans, we're almost done. A problem lies somewhere within that connector. Now, the owner of the car told me that the previous shop who looked at this car wanted to replace the PCM. It's a great thing he came to me for a second opinion because that would have been a very costly mistake. I took the connector apart and the pins look very clean. Now let's isolate our problem and let's start out with this side of the connector. Now let's do a measurement directly on the pins. Since this is the side coming from the PCM, we want to see that bias voltage on that pin. And there is our bias voltage, so nothing wrong with this side of our connector. Now I wanted to do the same thing on the other side of the connector, but look what happened. This is pin 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, <laughs> but there's nothing there. Now somehow that pin came out of the connector, but with the help of some pliers, I was able to push it back into its slot. Now it seems to be tight now, I can't get it out anymore. So let's reconnect it and see if we have got a fix. The moment of truth. Only if our circuit is complete and that 12 volts go back into the PCM, only then the PCM can start pulling that voltage to ground using duty cycle. Now if you want to learn more about duty cycle, watch one of my previous videos called Audi PWM Duty Cycle Explained. If our circuit is complete, and my test light lights up at the PCM, the PCM should be able to energize that variable compressor solenoid again, that swash plate should tilt, and the interior of this car should get nice and cold again. And let's start out by clearing the codes. No codes present. That's fantastic. I think I've got a happy customer. No parts required. Sounds a lot better than replacing the PCM and not fixing the problem. 
Now, if you like this video and if you want to learn more, please subscribe to my channel. And when you hit the bell, you will get a notification each time I post a new video. Yeah? Hey. Yeah? Diagnose then, fixed it again. See you next time, guys. Bye bye.